Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. I'm so excited to talk about this one, Ed. The Weapon X Barry Windsor Smith Marvel Comics Presents storyline is one of my favorite, favorite stories from, from my childhood, one of the first stories that I really dug into. So this is going to be a good one to, to go through. But Before, first, uh, what's going on? Patreon.com slash Ed is where I'm serializing my Red Room comic strips. Uh, three bucks will get you a complete archive. Issue one is up there right now. Jimmy, it was a three-page week this past week. Look at how dense that stuff That's is. a lot of panels, man. Drawn it at 9 by uh, 12, so got to get a lot of room in there, like a young Beavis and Butthead, and then have to draw a bunch of copycat killer girls who were influenced <laughs> by some of the bad guys in the uh, Red Room videos. That's man. a fun page. It's a whole universe that uh, that I'm drawn upon. Almost 150 pages are drawn at this point right now. Like I said, every Tuesday, new strips. My latest, October on in 1976. World's first blacklight comic featuring the underground Russian superhero from the 60s. This is available wherever comics are sold now, online and in comic shops, uh, including my website, jimrug.com, Comixology. You can find this wherever you get comics now, but get it quick because it is going fast. Jimmy, did you uh, read Weapon X like from, from the jump or did you uh, discover it a couple issues later? I read it from the from the jump. Uh, Marvel Comics Presents sold well on newsstands, so it was something I could find long before I had access to a comic book store, but I found out about it from an issue of Comic Scene. I see. And I couldn't find that issue. I was going to bring that, but it was an article about Weapon X and Barry Windsor Smith's, you know, forthcoming comic and what he was doing with it. At the time, Wolverine was my favorite character in comic. You know, I was picking that up every, every month or every, maybe twice a month sometimes and loved this character. And then, like, when I saw this, I had never heard of Barry Windsor Smith. This was early in my reading days. Mm -hmm. And so I saw it and was like, man, this looks incredible. Read this interview that sounded spectacular and couldn't wait for the for the comic to come out. I was probably a couple of weeks or a month ahead of schedule for when it was actually released. So, like, I was highly anticipating this thing. That's awesome, man. I uh, I discovered it kind of on a whimsy, just, just uh, digging through comics uh, when I was in like sixth grade or something. And I started with issue 82. Uh, so I read those those things to death. I uh, loved, I honestly, yeah, I think... That's a pretty strong cover. I think even the um, cartoon might have been out uh, at, at that point when I when I uh, discovered this comic. Uh, so like the Weapon X thing, it's like I sort of knew about it. The helmet, you saw that toy at Hill's department store. And once again, no idea who Barry Windsor Smith was, but... I'm also not a part of any kind of comics fandom or anything like that. So I didn't even have like comics and I didn't know about any of that shit. I just looked at that and was like, this is freaking super cool looking. Yeah. I mean, that, that was my gut reaction. It was, um, Marvel comics presents was a, was a comic I was aware of. My first comic book that I bought was Marvel comics presents a random issue. I didn't know what it was. I, it was a Hulk or Wolverine or something on the cover that caught my eye. So I bought it. But for anybody at home that doesn't remember this, this was like a big Marvel newsstand release uh, title, came out every two weeks, and it would feature four stories, four eight-page stories. Some felt like inventory stories, like Jay Lee's first story, you know, happens in Marvel Comics Presents towards, I think right after this, maybe, it comes up, when yeah, Sam yeah, Keith yeah. takes over. Yeah. And then there were other things that were like, Eric Larson has stories in here where he starts writing, you know, so like it's this cross-section of characters and creators, like you would get kind of a... Unusual mix, let's say. I love it. I love it. I I think that um, it's it's very sad that the series doesn't still exist because it was the Bush League for a bunch of new people. And no matter who that young cartoonist was, you get some sense that they know that this is their shot to show and prove. And whether their skills, you know, can can meet the match or not, there's something still about that artwork that is just different enough to be exciting. You know, you, you see, you see characters where, where the, the figure drawing is almost there, but that those backgrounds, it's that young thing. Those backgrounds are that <laughs> sixth, sixth grade perspective class, you know, an art school kind of thing. Um, I love, I love the series. Cool. Let's, uh, let's dive in. Let's do it, man. Can I we, can we start with this Weapon X logo is one of the iconic logos of 1990s comics to me. And I think Orzakowski did the the big like Wolverine. He might have done this one too, but I'm pretty sure he did the Wolverine logo with the big W. And I think it has the same hallmarks as, as this piece. So I want to give shouts to that because this is, this is an iconic logo. Like in future comics, whenever they mention Weapon X, whether it's Wolverine or... Deadpool or Kane, 
Like they use this, you know, and this is a very memorable logo. So we got to give props to that. Yeah. And you can see it's based clearly on the Wolverine logo where they're even taking certain letters from the Wolverine logo, like the N's, E's, the W. Yeah. It's all there. I copied this uh, this cover illustration in one of my sketchbooks, and I, I can't I don't think it exists anymore. But like line by line with a uniball pen, you know, it's kind of how what I was doing back then. I was into his stuff too. Like in, in issue eighty two, like I was I was uh, drawing stuff from that, and to me, it was like a leveling up. Like you start copying Alex Saviuk because the lines are more simple or something, and then you got to get up the courage to try to draw some of this yeah. stuff. All right, so right off the bat. I feel like this is amazing opening, right? Um, the professor, there's a couple of characters. This is the experiment, uh, Canadian black ops government agency kind of thing. Abduct Wolverine and bond his skeleton with adamantium. This is uh, Barry Windsor Smith. He's I never felt more stupid <laughs> than what I just said. <laughs> he's he's writing this thing, and I don't know that he's done very much writing. I believe this is his first. In con- right, I, so. When did you ever do something for the very first time and really kick ass at it? Uh, This comic is a challenging story to write because you have to, you have these abrupt stops that you have to account for. Eight pages usually is, is the length of a Marvel Comics Presents story. So you have to give the reader enough within this eight pages to kind of excite them about coming back. And it's an artificial parameter that would be a challenge to think about when you're you know doing your first venture out it is but you know at the same time it's not different than uh, a monthly comic or something the page counts different but it's still like you're using the same the same increments so at least once you get going maybe you figure out that rhythm you know you start thinking in eight page segments I wanted to show, I have a trade paperback that's a pretty late printing. This is from 2009. The original story is 1991, 1992. Um, This reprint is, I don't know, fourth printing or something. But I wanted to compare the color because we talk about that a lot. And Barry Windsor Smith colors this, which is noteworthy. You know, if you look at the credits of it, he does everything. Writing, drawing, color, and some of the lettering. The only credit that he doesn't have is... He co-letters with Jim Novak. Yeah. So I don't know who does what, if the lettering that Windsor Smith does is mostly sound effects, maybe, things Probably. that are kind of in the art, um, or if it's the arrangement, because it's such a strange way, once we get into some of the lab scenes and all the dialogue is like captions over top of action that we're watching, there's some really strange lettering things going on there that we'll get to. But I wanted to show off like the variation in color. This color is clearly reprinted exactly you know, from the original, so it's not uh, like a new coloring job, but it, it's a real good demonstration of what what cyan looks like yeah. on coated paper where it's not being absorbed at all versus on this newsprint where clearly it's seeping into the page and you're getting that, you know, kind of desaturated look due to the paper quality. Um, this is a weird subjective thing. I, I find this much more pleasing, but I don't know if it's a slam dunk. You know, you're still going to get all of the color stuff that he's doing. It's just a little bit more pronounced, higher contrast, maybe more garish. And I will uh, take a firmer position and say a lot more garish. Yeah, you you really need to color for the paper it's going on. Right. So back to story. In in the beginning story, we're just getting a little bit of background on where Logan is at this time. Um, Alcoholic, getting in bar fights doing some sort of law enforcement, military something, you know, I'm pretty good at that. And the professor finds this guy, this subject. He's been looking for one. You said a magic word, by the way, uh, professor. And he's a bald professor. And I, you, you can't help but think, I mean, that's a choice. Barry Windsor Smith is writing this thing. So, so like, there's, got, there's some allusion to, like, a bizarro world version of Professor X yeah, uh, in this comic. Yeah, and also, by the way, I was thinking of, of making this, you know, we just came out of our Halloween month of coverage, and I was thinking of doing this comic during October under the guise of this is a Frankenstein story. Yeah, it really is, man, especially this page. You see him cutting across different things, too. So like a monkey being experimented on, you know, eventually we're going to see Wolverine in these same sort of uh, procedures going through the same kind of process. Look at this amazing page of like the stuff that's on his coffee table 
and the drawing that goes into that. A lot, of, a lot of storytelling in, in a single image. It's really tight. The prophecy, neon light is amazing. So I fell in love with this. This is chapter one. I picked this up. I've been looking forward to it, and I'm just in awe. You know, guy lounging in like a really rundown, dinky room kind of apartment. This was it. This was everything I hoped it would be, and then some. And Windsor Smith, you know, we will go on to know lots about him. This ornate style is something that, like, by the end of his Conan run... This is where he's at in a lot of ways. He starts off as Barry Smith on Conan, ends up Barry Windsor Smith. Look at that, man. Incredible. Neon exploding. Really great stuff. And moody, everything I want out of there. And uh, just to point out real quick, like this is one of the highlights early on in the uh, backup stories. Paul Galassi doing a Shana story. Look how badass. Red Sky, Red River. You don't even want to start with that shit, Jimmy, <laughs> ben, because because there's a lot of good stuff. Steve Ditko writing Captain America comics. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll call out a couple as we go through, but probably uh, no, no, no time to spend on those right now. Windsor Smith does all the covers through this run. Yeah. So I'll, I'll linger on these covers as we get go from issue to issue so everybody can see them at home. They're beautiful. Like most of these covers are just absolutely stunning. And well, then someone else does the back covers. One of the um, parts of that early piece is that is that uh, this this woman gets indoctrinated. You know, she takes a job with, with, that, uh, with that lab or whatever. And towards the end of the Weapon X story... Um, it's established that, you know, she, she's worked with them for a long time. So the amount of time that transpires in this comic is substantial. Um, but you don't exactly get a sense of that when, when you read through the thing. It's from that one sentence where you kind of discover, cause it, because it kind of feels like it's all happening at once. All right. So part one, they identify Wolverine as the perfect subject. Part two, now they're abducting him. And Windsor Smith does this cross-cutting thing where this is... I don't know, like you say, sometime in the past, a couple days in the past or whatever, this is once he's been abducted and shaved and prepped for these uh, experiments that they're going to conduct. So this happens quite a bit throughout the story of like, you don't always know what time what time you're at. You yeah. know, sometimes the dialogue is referring to something that's happening, or something that happened or something that will happen. And it was pretty confusing read whenever I began. Yeah, that's and that's appropriate for the Wolverine character that has such a muddled past or whatever. Uh, one of the hallmarks of this run uh, really is just Barry Windsor Smith flexing on his figure drawing oh, acumen. Yeah. Uh, we we <laughs> yeah. see for maybe 30 pages of uh, freaking Weapon X in the, in the Star Wars back to tank in every possible view and angle one can imagine. And... B- just exquisite drawing. Yeah, all the wires and cables, too. You know what I thought of going through this again? Cyberpunk. Yeah, sure. We're going to see lots of examples. Guys wearing helmets, you know, like interfacing with this puppet-like controlled Wolverine at one point. But all the wires and everything. And it's neat you watch this liquid tank filling up over these several panels until he's completely submerged and floating in this whatever it is. And contrast color-wise, great use of color. Contrasting, you know, him being picked up at night versus being in this whatever this tank is. So it's pretty easy visually to distinguish what you're seeing. But here's this lettering that I'm talking about. This lettering reads this way. Down this side. Oh, back up. It's like a U-shape. Yeah. Real strange. It is. And and thankfully, you know, he's keeping track as colorist for who's speaking. And every individual gets their own color caption um, so that you can kind of parse them out. You know, there's... There's the professor. There's the professor. There's uh, Doctor Cornelius. There's the girl Heinz, and those are basically our main characters. Yeah, that's about it. I don't know if anyone else even has a name besides Logan, who uh, really we don't see him act human ever. You know, almost this entire time he's unconscious or or uh, in some animal like state. But here, yeah, here's your cast: Professor, Doctor, and Heinz. Yeah, she's got that Dee Dee Ramon. <laughs> Dutch boy haircut, man. Got to go paint, paint your fence. But uh, what I was going to say about her as a character is as the sort of comic book iconography of how she's drawn. I I was already aware of like Alicia Masters and Matt Murdock and stuff, and the way I understood comics drawing to be like if you drew kind of like baby blue eyes like that, that means that the person's blind. So like when I was a little dude, because she's always, she always looks like she's kind of like, because she's always pressing buttons all the time and it looks like she's feeling. Uh, I, I thought she was just a blind person. 
not too much happens here. They they realize like he has this healing factor, and also his hair grows back really fast, real fast. Right? Hey, do you think this is a, a nod to John Byrne? You know what? The Doctor Cornelius character design. You know what? Now that you say that, uh, that wasn't on my mind, but but sure, probably. There's there are things with this Doctor Cornelius like like as a writer, Barry Windsor Smith is inconsistent with the voice of. Uh, of of the characters a lot of times. So this guy, he he is a doctor and he'll start talking later on. And it's almost, I just, I know Barry Windsor Smith's a British dude. It's almost like Cockney slang in a way. Like it, it has, there's nothing professional about it. There's nothing approaching middle class about the way the guy talks. And, and I wonder if that's a choice or if he just kind of like didn't think about that part. Yeah, hard to tell. I mean, obviously, this is a shady thing. Like, they're doing some pretty harsh human experimentation, so... Right. Uh, the, not necessarily a doctor who's above board. Exactly. Like, uh, <laughs> there, there, there are, you know, I, there, is a, uh, there is a dentist that I went to that had open buttons on his shirt, and I saw a gold, <laughs> gold chain on his neck. I uh, have to point out the glacy splash pages. These things are amazing, man. Guy buried up to his, up to his neck. Tell you, Jimmy, don't, don't start it, man. <laughs> don't start it. Amazing character, right? And and once again, it's Barry Windsor Smith clearly has studied the figure. Like he he he's done Bridgman, you know. He's drawn all the Bridgman sketches and stuff because he is showing us that he knows exactly how to build a knee with yes. no kayfabe to it. And when he shows like the upward three quarter view of the head, where you're seeing under the neck and all that, it all looks right. And that shit is not easy to draw. Yeah, this is this really just blew my mind. As a, I'd never seen anybody that could draw like this in comics when I was a kid. I love all these background things too. They're they're very psychedelic. Yeah, let's 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 check some of these shits out, man. Because like, let's look at some old Barry Windsor Smith just for a second, and 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 see that he's he's retained some of that from his earliest. Yeah, we're gonna see pages like panels like this of just the chaotic hero going through bodies. Yeah, there's a uh, iconic Hercules splash. That has that kind of shit. And this and is great. This is a 1972 issue of Avengers. 20 years earlier. But this kind... There's, there's a lot in this issue that is in Weapon X, but a 20-year, you know, odyssey later of, of uh, art development and stuff. But, yeah, look But at similar that. concepts. Like, we're going to see Weapon X coming out of these weird color control panels and, and kind of lumbering around. I just find all of this stuff stunning. And, you know, good time to point out again, this is Windsor Smith's coloring this yes so you can see almost almost a watercolor like treatment of the way the color is applied another thing i had never seen and quite honestly i don't know of other comics that ever did this kind of coloring you know using like the that limited palette of the marvel dc 64 colors or whatever that palette is yeah it was i don't even know how you do this that feels like you're drawing on the separations oh right (laughs) the the color separations because they're organic shapes it's not like those are cut out right yeah, yeah, I don't know, and and I mean this the cyan certainly bleeds into the magenta there to create this. There, I mean, there are colors in here that were not used in other comic books, like like these kind of hues were never used because I mean they are they're just like these olive kind of drab colors all by themselves. But when you apply it to like a flesh tone and shadow, different story. It means something different. We're going to see his eyes come and go throughout this series. Uh, in moments whenever he's kind of out of control or doing something extremely violent, there'll be shots that show his eyes kind of peeking through this mayhem. And it feels very human to me. And it contrasts with, like, this professor and the doctors. They refer to him as mutant and animal. It's pretty It's pretty brutal. Like, not just the artwork, but also the story, uh, the, the dialogue, the text in it. It's a really brutal story, too. Kind of surprising... You know, it feels like hard R, even though the language isn't quite there. One of the but attractions, it's pretty brutal. One of the attractions to me when I picked up that issue eighty two man is uh, there's some good blood in it, and you just never saw that in comics, and that was an important thing for me. So this this repeats for issue after issue for a while, where it's like he's out of it, he comes to kills a guy or two, and they're like, yeah, let's keep going, right? Let's keep doing it <laughs> again with the shadiness. This this uh, this whole experiment is not on the books yeah 
Oh man, I would just go nuts over these kind of shots too. That was the coolest looking Wolverine I had ever seen. Yeah, man, that was just wild animal hair. You know, that's that's that is a choice that he came up with. He's like, I'm gonna show you guys the feral Wolverine. Yeah, and here it, you could have drawn like young Jim Rugg in this position, <laughs> saying the same exact thing. <laughs> but there you see, Look man, at that. The, another another killer splash page. These things are killing me, Paul Glacey. Oh, I know. Like, like you know, we'll just cover, we'll just do an episode about that shit, man. But like, there it is in a nutshell, man. That's your bizarro world, Professor X, who's like has no good intentions with this mutant. By the way, man, if he was doing Professor X. That's a great creepy version, like the turtleneck sport coat Professor X. Yeah, the Steve Jobs. P perfect for like that 70s, or yeah, I guess the 2000 version. The, the Steve Jobs who is like, ah, uh, my, Chinese, my Chinese factory workers making more iPhones. Oh, yes. Man. There are, as you say, this repeating motif of Wolverine fighting back against, um, I guess, captors is a word to use for these guys. So it does happen again and again where he's just, they give him a little bit of some kind of test. And then he seems to break free. Probably like his uh, healing factor, I guess, is, you know, the implication or whatever. But they're trying to set him up. You know, uh, if you're familiar with his history, Weapon X being a, a Canadian government operative. So they're trying to build a Canadian super soldier. Yeah. And whatever that may mean at this time, you know, um, maybe it's a little bit more on the assassin side of what, what a super soldier would look like. You know, the claws there, there's a revelation in this story of, I think the claws surprise everybody. Right, because he had these bone claws, and I don't think they were aware of that. And whenever the claws show up in the in the metal bonds with them, that's all just kind of a happy accident that comes out of it. Look at that for some fun lettering. Yeah, and some, some very uh, intricate coloring. A lot of intricate coloring in this thing, man. Like when he's in the little back to tank, and, and and Barry Winter Smith has to draw every bubble uh, in inside those tanks. He's he's coloring around those things. Manipulation of the mindless, Dr. Cornelius, it's your calling. So okay. they're, they're getting, they, they've done the metal bonding and now it's a matter of can we control this guy? Good amount of these long, narrow panels uh, within these, uh, these stories. Yeah, he really builds interesting panel compositions. Keep pointing those out as, as we see stuff that grabs our eyes. This was another one of the striking, I mean, the, there's so many of these covers that are just spectacular, but I remember loving this one as a kid. Probably the all red helped. And then one of my favorite panels, again, how do you build all this stuff in? There's so much wiring and intricacy, and this feels like the Frank modern-day Frankenstein. When you uh, even take a look at this stuff up close, like, these wires have appropriate lighting and shadow <laughs> yeah. on, on them and beneath them. The mania of it is exquisite. It, it's it's the exact stuff that, that I would just study over and over and the more lines the better the comic it was to me when i was you know middle oh, school yeah this is you know jim lee's doing x-men probably about this time so the lines were the th were the king uh i'm gonna point out brian hitch here early brian hitch doing a death's head story making an appearance so you know uk penciler uh, and writer cut, cut cut to a year later and brian hitch you know ultimates one of the and, and authority, one of the most popular cartoonists of the time, probably a decade after this. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that struck me because that's a completely British-drawn comic. The next several years, you'd see Marvel UK, you know, like going through those wizards of that time period. That was a big thing. So a couple guys that would have been around, around Marvel UK. Yeah. He does this with some of these panel borders where there's no gutter in between. That was something I was fairly unfamiliar with. Sure. And would just pour over, like, what's it mean? This kind of subtle background, too, to have a different panel, but not by a lot. You know, just yeah. a little bit, maybe add a little magenta to that blue. That kind of subtle coloring just was rare. Was this really a, a comic that came out every two weeks? Every two weeks, yeah. Although I think he worked on it for a long time. Right. In that interview and comic scene, he was saying, like, part of the way he got away with all the stuff he's doing because look at that like what is going on it's amazing it's so strange but he said you know he thinks the editors just didn't think he was going to finish it or whatever so he just showed up one day with the thing and was like oh I'm, I, I, it's done <laughs> here's the weapon x story i've been working on that's the way to do it that's that's what i recommend to everybody just just make the comic and then they they'll realize that uh, it would be too much work to edit it uh so stunning look at how much shit he's putting into this panel you know, like the giant skull on the screen behind the foreground action. 
Yeah. That's amazing. And and once again, the the figure work it's 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 all so well constructed. This is another another great one. So this is, I guess, the what Wolverine's thinking about or dreaming about, and it's the professor, and you can see the three claw marks going through his eyes and in between his eyes and his other eye. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good moment of foreshadowing. Shades of Outlaw Comics. I would call it an outlaw comic. It definitely has the uh, the ingredients and the energy. You know, I think of outlaws as all that ink and then blood, and it's like both of those things. Plenty of that. Yeah. Here. Here's a, here's here's the one knock against it, and and our setup here is perfect for it because uh, when you when he's drawing this, he has to compose and light the thing in a way to hide the fucking uncut fucking Wolverine. We should cock, see a little man. bit of something here <laughs> flopping around. <laughs> Sometimes it's pretty good. That, that that makes sense that that's shadowy, but. I think this one would be exposed on 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 David on David Cho's Instagram. <laughs> he 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 created the revelation that uh, Wolverine can never be circumcised because of his healing factor. <laughs> so he always draws these naked Wolverines with the fucking hooded monster man. <laughs> Love this one too. Like dry blood is how I interpreted what's on him in in this picture. Oh, that's cool, man! Like caked. I like this too. It's a little bit of a different inking line than we've seen. So it's it's Wolverine versus like a wolf. There's several of these, uh, I guess, tests is what I'll call them. But I mean, like monolithic standing there. Great body language. We're going to see a little bit more of that too as, as they kind of develop a control system for him and he's like a zombie. But at this point, he's just kind of there, not doing anything as the wolves are closing in on him. Look at the lighting on his face in that very first uh, panel. And there is the one Jim Lee... X-Men panel where it's Wolverine without a costume on holding like a zombified uh, a Professor X about to, about to blast him with the claws. Uh, Barry Windsor Smith, giant influence on those image guys and stuff like that is something that you could point to. Obviously, uh, Barry Windsor Smith did, did the life death stories and the, and the Lady Deathstrike issue of X-Men where uh, you know, those image dudes would have seen that work before they sort of grew into prominence. Also, by the way, the color. Yeah, I that mean, sky. The sky, the, the colors that are kind of um, being reflected off of the snow, mm -hmm. you know, like it, eventually we'll be seeing magenta off the snow. You never see that. No. And, you know, thing to point out is that like this is sound color theory. So you have your warm orange sky and then all your cool colors in the snow to, to really drive home that cold feeling. And, you know, your point about Jim Lee being a Windsor Smith fan, Wildstorm Rising, the crossover, mm -hmm. like, it's something that Windsor Smith drew there for uh, Jim Lee. So when Jim Lee had a chance, he definitely tried to uh, bring Windsor Smith into the fold. That's cool. I man. think even, I think Jim Lee may have even inked some of Barry Windsor Smith on, on that story. Uh, you know something? Um, we should, we should make note, uh, I, I don't have the lady's name written down, but it sort of has come out that he had some help with, with the color from the same woman who like sort of helped them with the color on kind of all of his stuff and and her name escapes me um yeah we should look that up and put it on screen some some and and if it's not on screen the k Fabers are smart they're gonna put that name in in the comments and yeah he went on to do storyteller at dark horse and it's a similar kind of look and i think that's that she had a big hand in that coloring with uh with that series yeah i think she colored red nails as well mm. or ha had something to do with it like the big uh treasury edition i love whenever they do this kind of stuff so like you know this is a test him fighting this pack of wolves out in the wilderness naked although it looks like he has a little loincloth on there uh like the sock but, right but then they'll cut to the cross section of whatever scientific analysis they're doing and i it just looks so cool this is this is a, a flex for a guy who can do perfect anatomy it's yeah. like, let's see what the inside of that arm looks like right. it's not it's enough to draw a perfect arm straight up bodies exhibit type shit man Really, really great. And then he collapses at the end. Like, they, they shut him off, basically. Yeah. And he just passes out on them. And mm -hmm. the professor says, leave him out there for the night. <laughs> Black blood, man. See, it's outlaw. This is another thing that you would see in some of these stories. Ken Stacy's the artist and letterer on this. So you'll see people doing things that maybe they hadn't done before. Yeah. Uh, you know, a chance to kind of 
I don't know, make comics a little bit different, eight pages, perfect place to experiment. Once again, man, a, a great series. Like if you see any issues of comics, uh, comics, uh, Marvel comics presents in the quarter bins, like just scoop it up. Cause there's going to be one of four stories in there that you're going to dig. Yeah. There, there are several notable stories throughout its run. There's a 25 part Gene Colan black Panther series early on. It's really rad, but there's several of those kinds of stories that you could pull out. Keeping up with the Frankenstein motif. Yeah, Frankenstein, cyberpunk wires going in and out of him everywhere, people working on him that way. Even uh, some Judeo-Christian kind of symbolism with him stretched, arms stretched out. I love all this background stuff. And I would see this in, like, backgrounds in, say, X-Force or, right. or Youngblood, where they don't really describe anything, but I, I swear it comes from this kind of thing. Dude, the weight of that figure, too, is so perfect, man. It, it really feels like an exhausted, like, dead weight figure. One of the hardest things to draw anatomically are feet, and that foot's perfect. Yeah. The toes, it's a, that's a tough angle, you know, like, foreshortening the foot. Like, don't just draw the foot correctly. Now foreshorten it. Yeah. <laughs> It's absurd how well he can draw. Great hands, too. All the knuckles are there. This kind of stuff's great. Whenever he's composing these panels and you get the, the checkerboard floor. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Is, is that is that uh, isometric uh, perspective, or is he doing that accurately? I'll tell you the truth. When I look at it, it has a little bit of a fisheye bend. Like, it, it bends a little bit. It's kind of rounded. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know if... I can't give somebody credit for that. That has to be accidental. <laughs> like that kind of drawing is savant. Like, you know, I've only seen like one person that can really draw that way. And it's, uh, it's, it's just not, I don't know. Maybe if it's based on a photo because of the curvature of the lens that you're referencing, you might be able to sneak it in that way. So much color on these faces too. You know, if, if you were tasked with coloring this, if, you know, we color our own stuff, right? That's just a bunch of flesh tone. Right. You know, it's one flat color or something. He's yeah. got half a dozen colors in those faces. Including just absence of color, pure white. That's something that n almost nobody does. Yeah, very, very, very true. All right, so I mentioned body language. This is where they're starting to control him now, almost like remote control style. And he's just this lumbering. It's like he's not awake. How good is that? Is him being heavy? They talk about the battery packs, how much they weigh. But it's just this, like, okay, he's up and, you know, like, like move him around, walk him around the room. You know, give me the remote control. They tell him what levers and stuff do so that you can actually move him around. And that's what you're seeing there is, like, this zombie version of Weapon X, you know, learning to, learning to make him walk and, and to control him. That's some dark stuff, too. Just the concept of that. This is a, this is a great page, man, because there's a, there's a great swerve here. And Dr. Cornelius is like, no, yeah, he's totally out of it. Don't, don't worry about it. Because the professor's freaked out. He saw what's in the mind of this animal. And he, the animal wants to fucking pierce his brain with yeah. his claws, right? So uh, the doctor's like, spit on him. I, I promise you, he, he, he won't do shit. So... Yeah, where's he? I was looking for Somewhere where he right. says it, but it it is right in this uh, in this page. Yeah, so then pours the coffee on him, and then with this right there, that drop right there, it it looks like he's staring directly at the freaking professor, and then they zoom in. It's just a little dab of uh, coffee that drips down, man. But like, I thought that was an amazing kind of swerve, where it's like, oh shit, he's he's awake. Yeah, and it is a great point of how this professor is so apprehensive now with anything around him. Yeah, there's a subplot that we, that's never resolved that the professor is not working alone and that he has people that he answers to. Yeah. And we never get any any real answers with that, but it further adds to his paranoia and, and you know, our understanding of his paranoia. I love this cover. The this iconic was one that helmet, really man. spoke to me. The iconic helmet. The pose and everything. Just really loved it. Another thing about this Marvel Comics Presents stuff, when you when you get, like... Uh, a, a special creator to do their thing. It's almost like that Legends of the Dark Knight Batman series right. where it's just like, bring in a heavy hitter, let them do their, let them make their statement. Let them do their ultimate Weapon X, you know, Wolverine story. They get in, they get out, you know, damn your continuity and uh, move forward. This is awesome. Yeah, another, an the next animal test, a giant grizzly bear. Yeah, yeah, we're <laughs> escalating and, uh, Pass the test with flying colors, I'd say. Love this. This two-page spread, spectacular for me. Love every part of it. 
his ability to like have weight and motion, it's real strong. I used to copy this one a lot. And then the Wranglers bringing him back in. That is real iconic. No wonder they make an action figure of that. The visor is is perfect because in in the the darkest shadow, you could just have that little swath of of white, you know, to to go across. And then you can tell whenever he's not on because it's shut off. The the visor goes dark. So the handlers are like walking him back, and uh, they think that he's out of it, but he's not. And he he wakes up and he starts again. You know, it's that repeat of like killing the guards. Killing the guards and breaking out. Yeah, it's a it, once again, man. You have eight pages to to tell your story, and and you you know how th this this actually the story works like the old you know nineteen twenties nineteen thirties like Flash Gordon serials would would work this way, where it'd be this very very small unit of time that the episode has to transpire always ends on a little bit of a cliffhanger. Cliffhanger almost always gets immediately resolved, and then ends on yet another cliffhanger very quickly yeah the serial is a, a pretty good description of this uh here's one to call out steve ditko's name is going to appear in a few of these backups this yep. is a captain america that he's writing and penciling with terry austin doing inks yep uh but we are picking up immediately after wolverine breaks out of that that room that he was in that was the last panel of the last piece uh we see the the remains of one guard and a couple more that aren't going to have any more effectiveness against him. Great, great figure laying there in perspective. You feel the 3D of him. Uh, it's because of the, the lighting and the curvature on, on these, um, on the uniform and stuff. Not easy to do. A lot of people draw very flat looking yeah, characters lay in there. Also point out, cut off arm. Yes. Something you're not going to see in a ton of Marvel comics at this time. Still approved by the comics code, by the way, these <laughs> issues. Of course. I like this background. He's doing the color, those color rectangle shapes, but this time it's not against a black background that we often see. Instead, it's that blue background. I love that. I think that's real effective. Looks looks nice. Something I would steal. I like that blue with the bright colors popping out. Yeah, it's a color comic, you know, try to get some color in a damn thing. He does really well with that. You know, imagine how dark and drab this, this could be. Like you're in a, some kind of technical lab facility. Like all of this could be gray backgrounds, but instead we get panels like that like this green. The professor, meanwhile, has bowed out and he's calling his superiors and is like, what is going on? He's lost control of Wolverine. And now the question is, is Wolverine acting on his own or is it this other, somebody else, somebody above their pay grade that's operating him and to what ends? Right. You know, like suddenly the staff is now being hunted by this killing machine that they've built. Good Man, glutes. look at this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Good glutes in, 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 uh, in the light. Almost shades of uh, Wolverine stalking through the sewer of the Hellfire Club from the from the iconic X Men, you know, early X Men burn issue. I love the generic goons. Yeah, cut to two years later, and they're uh, Valiant's hardcore. <laughs> right. I think it's the same exact costume. <laughs> <laughs> One of those tall vertical panels, really great layout. Wow, it really red is, on man. purple, nice color. And here he comes, man, coming for the professor. A little Peckerwood professor, man. He ain't long for this world. And this is what we're hearing. So you're hearing like the professor's microphone on intercom. So that's why you see like Hines and, and Cornelius reacting because they can't do anything about it. Now all I'm thinking about is John Byrne with that guy. Like I'm staring at that cover. <laughs> <laughs> There's a resemblance, right? I, I think I think you're onto something for sure. And professor is now saying destroy Weapon X. They pull him out of the the bloodbath, but he's uh, he's suffered some losses in that. Yep. And there's your Ditko uh, doing Captain America. Don't start, Jimmy. <laughs> All right, John Byrne now facing off against Weapon X. His favorite character. <laughs> and this also, is, this and, is your cover for a lot of the trade paperbacks. They several of them have different different cover treatments, um, so you can see like this is the artwork. It's been recolored and kind of like faux painted over and reduced way too much in size. But this is the image that it's coming from. Yeah, yeah. The trade I have uses that as a um, cover image as well. Marshall Rogers and Al Williamson teaming up on Daredevil in this in this backup. Talk about a pretty nice pairing. I was thinking this might be the last great Marshall Rogers artwork. Yeah, yeah. I'm not I'm not too too schooled on the guy, man. 
great like Frazetta type composition or like the back cover of the Red Nails. I was going to uh, say it's tra- so barbarian like. Yeah. It's right in line with that stuff. And and just every figure that's drawn is drawn beautifully. Like you just see like a little piece of these guys and, and it's just like I think he's I think this is a painstaking comic to draw. Like I don't I don't think that he has this stuff memorized um and is you know really trying hard to get it all to, to work. Like it, it just it just feels like he's using extra tools. There are amazing figures on display here everywhere. You you mentioned that cut up guy on the floor last issue and how lifelike he was in 3D. It's true of all these bodies. Yeah. And especially like this guy being flayed in the air. It feels like he's being lifted and kicking and thrashing. It's incredible to get that kind of motion in in in, in a drawing like this. Agreed. There's a lot of uh, original art online of this comic. If you Google this, you can find tons of these pages. It's Scott. We need a Weapon <laughs> X Arst edition, man. Come on. That stuff's out there. And it's like, it's built. Like you're describing it. You can look those up and see all kinds of marks all over those pages. Those are not clean originals, man. There's That's paste cool. ups and, and, and corrections and everything. It, it's my number one choice for an artist edition, but you can find a lot of that online. Man, it's so dark. So Professor's hand has been cut off. He's bleeding. They they put a tourniquet on. They're going to this, like, where they make the adamantium, like the core, because they think that's the most secure place to get to. Cornelius has to take up arms because Weapon X is coming for them. Yeah, and this is where Cornelius starts talking like like regular folk and just using slang words and, and, and you know, provincial speak. This is a very iconic Wolverine I don't know if he's lifting it, like if other people have lifted this from him, if he's lifting it from somewhere, but this is a pose of a Wolverine pose, that yeah. we see uh, all over the place. Sure, yeah. Just l- lunging towards the cam. This is pretty great, too, because Professor starts to sound like he's going nuts, like he's 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 in shock, is what Cornelius says, and it really reads that way, where it seems like he's descending through this thing of, like, paranoia, of course. A guy just tried to, a monster just tried to kill him, cut off his hand, and the people he was working with have abandoned him or may even be the ones behind trying to kill him. And it's just this like madness, his dialogue, what's going on with him. I think, I think uh, Windsor Smith does a really good job of portraying his breakdown. Sure. Great design on that character too, man. Just like that odd shaped skull and all the, uh, the sort of line work of like the jutting cheeks. How awesome is this panel? Could it come out of Watchmen? Oh, I know. You have Danger is right in the middle of the page, and then the claws scraping over the nuclear sign. It's perfect. I even like the uneven like floor panels. Yeah, yeah. That was an image that I would see in promotional material for this. Pretty dark, man. Feral Wolverine, man. Yeah, he looks insane. Which I think is what you're going for at that at that spot. You want to see just a glimpse of the Marshall Rogers? It's worth a glimpse. It's on the Kayfabe Instagram. Look at that. Al Williamson's such a great great anchor for for all this Daredevil stuff. All right, we're getting close to the end here. Yeah, three this issues is, to go. This is Eddie P territory right here, man. Like I have this these you know last couple issues like fully memorized. Again, I want to point out the color. They're in a factory. Like, there's no reason for this kind of color except that you're in the business of entertainment. Right. Like, find a way to make this look the best it can look. There's the big narrow panels. That's the end of uh, Cornelius, I guess. R.I.P. C- Canadian. The Knucklehead. Uh, <laughs> John, John Byrne. The whole reason Wolverine wasn't killed in those early X-Men issues, right? That's it, man. <laughs> And this is some like the core where uh, Professor's plan is throw Hines over to use as bait to get Wolverine into that core and then incinerate him. Man, you could see how I thought that she was just like some some blind, you know, derelict or something. Yeah, he he draws her face throughout a lot of this with just minimal, you know, like there's no line to indicate a nose or anything, just the nostrils. It's very minimal. It's almost lizard like. It could be it could be part of like V. There was a really good one. It might have been in the previous issue where it was her face in profile and it really looked like it could have been like the aliens from the V T V show or something. <laughs> and sure enough, 
Here he comes. Yeah, man. It's a good ending for your cliffhanger ending. This is uh, this is Dwayne Turner. I was really into him because he had done a Black Panther series that was reproduced from his pencils. Yeah. Which was like, what? Is, this is the best artist ever. So I would follow him, and he had a lot of different looks, you know, depending on the inkers and stuff. It was always weird, like, how do you interpret those pencils? Right. That's pretty good. Gotta, gotta, gotta kill your... Gotta kill your darlings sometimes, man. All right, so here he comes to execute Heinz and getting ready to trigger this core meltdown thing. He looks great, Wolverine. And there's where you see his eyes. He's starting to talk a little bit. Like, uh, he doesn't, he doesn't, that's not his enemy. That's not who he's after. Yeah. And you just see a little bit of his eyes peeking through the carnage of what's left of his face. And look at that, man. That's like the danger room. Danger room. Bizarro world danger room right there. All right. Time to uh, time to, to purge what's in there. Never a good look running around butt ass naked <laughs> in front of ladies. You don't want that. You don't want that image. I wonder how uh, Windsor Smith wrote this. Like in his notes, if it's like okay, time to to melt Wolverine here, to incinerate him. How am I gonna draw that? It would be those like thought exercises that that like. I, you, you, I would play with my friends when we were kids. Like, okay, so if you're immortal, what happens if you cut your head off and throw it into the ocean? Like, what kind of life is that? <laughs> and, you know, you got... We all had those thoughts, right? <laughs> well, see, I couched it because just in case if uh, we all didn't. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> um, this is... The claws are coming in in reflection in the glasses. Yeah, great panel. Yeah, we have we have a guy who is essentially physically biologically immortal. He's the Terminator at this point too, with his metal with his metal skeleton for sure. And uh, listen, he can't die, and you just burn him up. It's got to sting a little bit and leave a dude pissed. There's like shit dripping off of his face. It's like his face is melting. So what happens it's Freddy here? Freddy Krueger now, man. And, and this is again the professor being betrayed by his superiors is that the temperature in this core keeps going down instead of up. Like somebody overrode what he was trying to do to get rid of Weapon X, and uh, his, his superiors are like, no, we're going we're gonna to see this through. This panel was everything to me in sixth grade. This is the one, I brought this comic to school to show people, like, yo, check out Wolverine. He actually used his claws for once, you. Like, how cool is that? He does this thing that the eyebrows are sort of like, I don't know, singed or something like they're hanging out. It's so gross. Yeah, it you really can't even tell like what it is. Pieces are coming off of him. You can't even tell what it is, man. It pulls the claws back. Oh, what? Is he going to go easy on him, maybe? No. <laughs> there We've is. already seen this. We know what happens. Prophecy, prophecy fulfilled. Wow. All right, Ed. Last uh, last issue, the big the big conclusion issue here, triple size. So we're gonna get twenty four pages out of this this one, and uh, he even gets front and back covers on this. Not the best of the covers, but pretty good. There's so many good covers in in this run. Yeah, it's hard to draw faces that big. Like I imagine you, he would probably have drawn that really small, blown it up on a Xerox machine, trace it off. Could be, yeah. Hard to draw that big and, and keep it all in perspective. Yeah, because you never draw that size. Yeah. Yeah, it's very atypical. I mean, it's bigger than the human head that you would be drawing that, you know, 24 inches across. Really great use of magenta color. You don't see that often in comics, especially at this time. Yeah. Very smart in that it stands out. And it's about the brightest color you can put on, on paper, too, I think. It, uh, out of these color, you know, this printing process on newsprint. So this part loses me. I enjoyed rereading this story. I think that he does a really good job up to this point, and then I get I get lost. I reread this again last night to try to sort it out. You know, we've seen the carnage, and it's almost like Weapon X is waking up now, and we see the aftermath of what he's gone through. Everybody that he killed is dead. It's kind of it's over, Johnny. <laughs> it's uh, I I think what we're looking at here uh, is. Um... This is a Barry Windsor Smith version of, and it was all a dream kind of story. I think it's memory implants. Right, because like, there's, it repeats. Like, it's this repeating thing, and we've seen the earlier version of that. Uh, it could also be just completely in the mind, because we saw that computer simulation play out early, early on. So, once again, it's still, it's his version of, 
You know, it was all a dream. It, none of this. this everything, really cool. everything we watched, everything we read, didn't happen. Same deal. Yeah, it's real odd, right? White, yeah. le- white lettering, and and this is like the question. Like I always wonder, like like how they do that because, you know, we we talked about like using acrylic acrylic paint as like your your white media. Like, good luck fucking lettering with with that. You know, I think it's some kind of like inverted thing. Yeah, it it is. I'm I'm sure this is lettered just black on white, mm-hmm. and then it is some sort of an inversion process. Yeah. So, what's happening here? We're like getting into his brain or something as he's just losing it. And then we cut back to almost a um as if this is his escape was part of like the next piece of training. Yeah, because we're starting to see di- the dialogue of like the familiar caption colored dialogue of our of the characters we've been following for the past, you know, 50, 60 pages. Yeah, we're back in experiment mode and and they are apparently watching. Love this man. Another one of the animal tests. So Siberian tiger. Look Incredible man. Look at the anatomy on that thing too, man. And and like this kind of view is incredibly tough to draw. Like the downward three quarter view of like anything. From the People. back, like muscles on the back. Exactly. I can't draw muscles on the back of a dude, let alone a cat. I you know, that's a that's the thing that I always talk about. It's like it takes a lifetime to learn how to draw the human figure and now you and now you uh just got the job to draw Animal Man comics. <laughs> you know, like that that's like almost a nightmare. We've been seeing Wolverine fighting these animals in the snow landscape. Look how effective it is that this isn't a night fight. You right. know, it's it's super clear that this is at night compared to like the wolf fight that we saw. At, w- w- I felt was like dawn or something. That's true. I always admire whenever people are able to convey that that part, and I shouldn't. It should. That's not that hard to do. Yeah. Have some attention to detail. Whoever's drawing it, coloring it, so on. But it doesn't always work that way. Yeah, and it looks like a use of like hundred percent cyan, hundred percent magenta to create that deep, deep blue. It's a great color, man. I've been I've, I I I got a uh, Marvel coloring thing recently, so I've been going through it and looking at some of those colors. And it is it is what you're saying. And check this out, man. Brian Murray from X Force Number Two did a little <laughs> cup of coffee on one panel. <laughs> <laughs> but see, the team is all back intact, and that memory implant thing is something that uh, was a big part of Wolverine over the the couple of years after this. Like when Larry Hama takes over Wolverine and they build like Wolverine Fifty, the big you know, one of the big issues, it's all like memory implant stuff. And they use some of the images from this story. Yeah. It, it, unfortunately, uh, I, you know, I'm sure, I think they were going for something, but I think I and many, many, many readers as well uh, felt some disrespect with that stuff and, and felt some, some abuse from, uh, from the writers where it's like, if, okay, so we're reading this thing, we're investing in this thing. And now you're telling us like, it's meaningless. Uh, so what it does is it it um, all rules for the universe that get established get thrown out the window. And you can only do that so many times before you're just like checked right. out, you know, weird color, like a, like a colored gray using the using CM and Y. Here's a reference to uh, the professor talking to, you know, somebody like yeah. a higher power and Cornelius is like. It's it's uh you know very creative or whatever throwing throwing weapon at, trying to confuse weapon X. It's like you were a stooge or a flunky instead of the genius behind experiment X. And he's like, oh, yeah yeah that's that's what I was doing. <laughs> so that's one that that's a, a part of the story that's never addressed. I don't know if that's. I mean, I guess there was a weapon X series, so who knows? I'm, I would assume Marvel addresses it at some point, but I wasn't interested in the non Barry Windsor Smith version. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I don't remember a Weapon X series actually, man. And and then it's unclear that this is even real. So so once again, it was all a dream. It's all a loop. This is a weird part. So you get the end right here. Oh right, yeah. Except we have several more pages, almost another chapter's worth of this, and gorgeous colors through this part. But you have the glasses now for the third time that we've seen the the three hold glasses from the claws. Yeah. And now Wolverine's back in this snow, but also in this landscape, like, what is this? Northern Lights? Right. The, the Aurora Borealis? Yeah, I think... I it's think pretty cool. It's like... Okay, so it's like... This, it, here's how I read it. It's expansive glacier kind of thing. And it's sunset reflected off of glacier. That's that's sort of how I 
read it because it's, it's hot colors. You know, it's warm this sky tree colors. This placement and this whole composition reminds me of like Japanese, like the um, Hokusai or something. Yeah, yeah, like like the triptych that uh, Kevin Hazanga drew in in Super Monster Number Fourteen. <laughs> Yeah, this is the Marvel Windsor Smith version of that. <laughs> wow. I love this drawing. Impossible that he draws this. This to me is convincing uh like the formation of icicles yeah. on, you know, your hair's wet first and it mats together and then pretty soon the ends start to freeze. Yeah. Impossible to draw this stuff and he nails it. Yeah, he looks it looks like uh a a, a caveman that just got thawed out of some sort of glacier. I was I was like kind of marveling at this uh, foreshortening right here. Yeah, that's a pretty trippy drawing. That's a real strange angle, hallucinatory. Yeah, yeah. This whole like last piece. Right before we got into this weird sequence, it was him killing everybody, mm -hmm. or at least killing the professor. I guess. I guess this is Heinz and and uh, Doctor Cornelius is the two that we hear talking now. And that's basically the end of it. Right. I don't know, man. It's it's so trippy. It's such like a uh, a mind bending weird story, especially because of this type of an end. But what a ride this was at the time. It had to be maddening. I can't remember specifically waiting like two weeks and then reading a chapter. I would probably go back and like reread the previous couple of chapters when I'd get a new one. But it's such a part of a one big story really not made to be read over the course of, uh, I don't know, six months or so while it was being serialized. But that's just the nature of everything was that way. Like, doing an original graphic novel would have been unheard of in 1991 for, for a Wolverine origin story. The uh, the little individual units, um, to me, uh, they, they're sort of plenty in, in a lot of ways. Like, you know, you get, like, a, a satisfying little little piece. You you apply your imagination to what happens like kind of before and after like reading it all together, like in the, in the big unit. Um, if you like grab the trade, there's never a designation for, for chapter breaks right. or anything like that. So it is like this, like one continuous thing, but it does still have all of those beats built in just naturally. So it makes for kind of an odd flow. Like you don't read stories that that feel like this you know it it um doesn't abide by uh it doesn't abide by like classic like storytelling structure in 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 many ways because even like a lot of the stuff that happens at the beginning is very repetitive you know it's a, it's the same motions if, if it's not feral wolverine you know fucking some dudes up it's feral wolverine fucking up some animals and we just escalate and, and get bigger animals um you know, this is the story he wanted to make, obviously. See, this is the, the cover to the trade that I had. How much better is this cover than this cover? <laughs> I know, <laughs> right? This is, this is just awful. Whoever's responsible for this cover, shame on you. Yeah. You had you had 100 plus pages of Barry Windsor Smith art to, to pull beautiful images from, and this is what you came up with? We talked about how great many of these covers are, and this <laughs> is what you came up with? And this, and we praised the logo, and this is what you chose as a logo, the most generic font? Shame on whoever, whoever built this cover. Shame on you. Yeah. Shame on everybody that approved it. Shame. Shame. You're in a visual medium, and that's what you came up with. You should all get in a different line of work. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. These are some of the different pieces that were Barry Windsor Smith or on different editions and things like that. This was a Wolverine gallery piece. I've never seen that piece before. Yeah, back of issue of uh, Wolverine number four. Like the uh, first, I don't know, dozen or so issues of the Wolverine ongoing series would have these Wolverine galleries. Yeah. There are some great ones, man. There's a Kent Williams one that when David Show was talking about Kent, Kent Williams with us, it's all I could think of because it was such a twisted version. But that's what you could do with them. You know, they were sort of free to do a do a wild version of Wolverine, interpret Wolverine. They were always fun. They 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 inspired a lot of like the back covers of Street Angel. Whenever I was doing Street Angel, it was because of those pinups where it was like, yeah, man, let's do a radical interpretation of this character. Was that like a modern, uh, more modern uh, Barry Windsor Smith Wolverine piece, or is that yeah, yeah? This was a sequence that he had done in two thousand and one. It's a flashback from Wolverine 166 and uh, in a cover to Wolverine 167. So this was a couple of pages that he did in 2001 featuring like the Weapon X type thing. And he certainly didn't color these. Yeah, for sure. It looks like maybe he didn't ink them either. 
Yeah, it is, is a weird is my line, guess. Right? Like that doesn't look like that that's a, doesn't look like his inking to me. But catching a quick paycheck. I don't know what he was doing in two thousand one either. You know, I mean, he's he's certainly a guy who has changed a lot over the years, so it's possible. Honestly, and this is like a digital painted version of that iconic. A, a part of us reading this right now is just in preparation for the monster book that that is going to be coming out uh, from Fantagraphics in like uh, just a few short months, man. Yeah, it's super exciting to get a new major work from him um, because he is an older guy. He's got, I don't know, decades. He's, when did he start? Late 60s, maybe? He's probably early published work. So certainly a guy with a long career in comics and awesome that he has a new massive work coming out. But there's other Barry Windsor Smith to look at. Um, I mentioned Storyteller. I see Ad Astra in Africa right up there, which would have been the third uh, installment of the Life Death story in, any of his uh, x-men, x-men issues are worth pulling out and, and going through so probably not the last time we're going to look at barry windsor smith and uh i enjoyed this reread you I, know ed you before i went berserk on this cover <laughs> design <laughs> uh you mentioned how much repetition there is in the reading and and there is a lot but it's also uh there's a lot in there like stuff that i don't remember from whenever i had read this in the past there is kind of a build going on in that and Pretty cool, man, and, and fun to see like Barry Windsor Smith's first writing attempt. You know, a lot of artists do this, right? Like, it doesn't always work, or it's mixed results. But it's pretty fun to see somebody like Windsor Smith. It's like I'm right, I'm write my own story. I I would I would much rather just like as, as a fan of the medium, I would much rather have a story that doesn't quite work uh, from one vision than just your average assembly line comic, like. I've read thousands of those. Those do nothing for me. Uh, let me let me see what you could do, you know, and, and make your statement, get in, get out, and then move on to, you know, the next thing. I'd be curious what he was reading and thinking about when he did this, because comics now are so different. You have people coming from all different industries, backgrounds, reading backgrounds that are writing comics. But at this time, Marvel was really built on that Stan Lee model of like, the captions will reinforce what's going on and... You know, it was pretty straightforward, and usually we'd, we'd say it more than once. Yeah. That that interview that we read with him in Wizard, he talks about how embarrassing he thinks that kind of writing is. It's so bad. Right. And it's not here. No. Like, he's not... The, the exposition is not telling you what you see in those panels. It's almost creating more of a mystery of, like, connect these dots. It's a real different writing style that makes sense now. 1991... I, I'm sure I was reading this going, I don't know what's going on. I'm not sure he's talking. <laughs> I'm so confused, but it looks amazing. Just just along for the ride, <laughs> man. Uh, but then you start to, you know, you start to figure it out. Like, okay, this green color caption is this guy. This this color caption is this person. I had no trouble with it on the reread. Yeah. You know, following along. But uh, pretty different for like, again, I mean, that's a 30-year-old book we're looking at. Happy to do so as well, man. Uh, because it's been... 20 years right. since since I uh, even cracked it open. And the beauty of the channel is gives us uh, an excuse to do so. For sure. Get out of here, Jimmy. Yeah. K Fabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new videos are available. We're on that race to 30K, man. We're super close. So make sure you hit that uh, subscribe button. Octobrian is in stores now, available on uh, Jim's website and Comixology. Patreon.com slash Ed is where I'm serializing my Red Room comics for early adopters. Three bucks gets the archive for that. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. I'm juiced up, Jimmy, man. We got to get back to making our own comics. Give these dudes their marching orders. Read more comics.